Physicists believe that our universe is made up of indivisible particles. Everything – galaxies, planets, animals, cells, atoms, nuclei. These particles are minuscule, at least a billion times smaller than an atom. But they're amazingly interesting. They're called leptons, quarks, gauge bosons, and then there's the Higgs boson. My bit of the universe is made up of four particles. Two of them are really tiny, but they're extraordinarily cute. They're called André and František. And then there's my wife Jana. This is where my day as a particle physicist begins, among heaps of toy cars and stuffed animals. Come with me to experience the excitement that drives thousands of particle physicists to overcome the impossible on their road to discovery. Our trip starts with particles. What else? Even in ancient times, people probably asked themselves, can an object be broken down into ever smaller and smaller pieces, or are there some pieces that can't be broken down anymore? In their attempts to find an answer, two people in ancient times may have taken some stones and thrown them at each other. I mean stone against stone, not stone against people. Unfortunately, throwing stones at other people has been a much more common experiment since ancient times. When the stone breaks, the experiment continues with the pieces, and when the pieces stop breaking, does that mean that they can't be broken down anymore? Perhaps you'll say, what would happen if they were thrown against each other with even greater force? But then what would happen after you had invited the two greatest strongmen in ancient times to take part in the experiment? The ancient philosopher Democritus thought that matter cannot be broken down endlessly. He introduced the term atomos for the smallest particle. Atomos simply means indivisible. Democritus's concept of an atom corresponds more to what is nowadays called a molecule. In the 19th century, the concept of atomos was used for the basic structural elements of molecules, that's to say atoms. However, this was premature because it soon turned out that atoms are tremendously divisible, despite the fact that it is minutely small in size. A typical atom is 10 to the power of minus 10 meters, or one tenth of a millionth of a millimeter. Surprisingly, atoms and their components are still being investigated in the same way as in ancient times, by smashing them against each other. For example, at the beginning of the 20th century, the famous physicist from New Zealand, Ernest Rutherford, carried out an experiment in which he irradiated a very thin gold foil with alpha radiation, that is, the nuclei with the element of helium. He had thought that all the alpha particles would pass through the foil without changing their direction of flight. But what happened? Some of them even turned right round after striking the foil. Rutherford concluded that the gold atoms must contain a very heavy nucleus that alpha particles bounce back from. This is the same thing as if you throw a tennis ball at a medicine ball. The tennis ball will bounce back at you while the medicine ball will scarcely move. However, if you throw the tennis ball at a ping pong ball, the tennis ball will not even notice that something has come into its path and will continue in its original direction. It's the same thing when an alpha particle strikes electrons from the electron envelope of an atom of gold. Most of Rutherford's alpha particles pass through the gold foil without changing direction. Just a very few of them turned right round. From this, Rutherford concluded that the nucleus must be very, very small, and it really was tiny, 10 to the power of minus 14 meters, which is 10,000 times smaller than a typical atom. Experiments of the ancient type, or if you like, experiments of the Rutherford type, are still being performed today. The main idea is as follows. If we want to investigate something very small, we need to send something towards it that moves very fast or, more precisely, something with high energy. Quantum theory teaches us that every particle can be used for microscoping. The greater its energy, the better its spatial differentiating ability. This simple principle was used, for example, in the 1960s in an experiment that proved the existence of quarks, the particles from which protons and neutrons are composed. However, the energy of the particles that were used was 10,000 times greater than the energy that had been available to Rutherford. The Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, accelerator experiment in the International Laboratory at CERN in Switzerland is also a Rutherford-type experiment. It's the best microscope that has ever been constructed, 
and is capable of investigating objects with dimensions of 10 to the power of minus 19 meters. That is to say, objects 10,000 times smaller than a proton. It achieves this fantastic spatial differentiation thanks to the huge energy with which it accelerates the particles that it uses as projectiles. An important task for the LHC is to determine whether particles which are currently regarded as indivisible are nevertheless composed of even smaller particles. From the present day viewpoint, the basic particles that cannot be further subdivided are the electron, the muon, the tau, neutrinos, quarks, gluons, photons, W and Z bosons, and the Higgs boson. Is it not fascinating that nature in all its enormous variety is composed of these particles? Is it not fantastic that people have been able to reach this conclusion by throwing stones against each other? I live in Prague, the capital city of the Czech Republic. I work 45 minutes away from my home. I take the underground on a bus. The bus line ends at Prague Zoo, and it's nice to travel with kids looking forward to seeing the animals. I'm arriving at my university. It's the Charles University, which is about 700 years old. Well, not this building, of course. The university is spread all over Prague. Here in Troyer, we just do physics. Besides Charles University, Troyer is also home to part of the Czech Technical University. The buildings are full of microscopes, cryogenics, plasma devices, there's a nuclear reactor, a particle accelerator, and plenty of other stuff. The site was built in the communist era and the spectacular thing is that students had to help to build it. These were difficult times for everybody, and the life of a physicist must have been very different than it is nowadays. There's an urban legend about a physicist who topped up his income by driving a bus during the communist era. One day he was driving a group of foreign physicists who were in Prague for a conference. Two of them sitting near the driver's seat were talking about theoretical physics. He interrupted them and explained what they were discussing. They were shocked. In Czechoslovakia, even bus drivers had an in-depth understanding of physics theory. When they hear the word experiment, people mostly imagine a person heating up some strange liquid, which ends up exploding, or a person working on an instrument full of wheels and wires. They do not usually imagine an experiment that is as high as an eight-floor building and as long as a swimming pool. However, these are the dimensions of the Atlas experiment at CERN, and of similar huge experiments based on the LHC accelerator, short for Large Hadron Collider. These are detectors of the smallest known particles, and it does seem a bit strange that devices need to be so gigantic. The Atlas experiment is a kind of outsized camera. The aim is to take photographs of the most high-energy particles that humanity has been able to create. The LHC is used for accelerating and smashing. A large part of ATLAS functions on the same principle as the silicon chip in your camera. ATLAS even has the same number of pixels as the biggest and best smartphone camera. One ATLAS photo is several megabytes in size. A camera can produce an image like that. 
However, you cannot order an atlas online for $2,000, and you certainly would not be able to get it into your pocket. There are certain differences between atlas and a camera. Atlas can take 40 million pictures in one second. You won't find anything like that online. Atlas has to withstand many years of being exposed to huge doses of radiation. It has to function in an extremely strong magnetic field. It has to absorb high-energy radiation or particles and keep track of their properties, such as their energy and their velocity. To absorb an ordinary proton born in a collision at LHC, Atlas needs two meter thick layers of iron, and that would not exactly fit into your pocket. Atlas would not fit into that pocket either. It weighs 7,000 tons. It is incredible that the people who constructed a device the size of an eight-floor building know the position of each wire with the accuracy of a single hair's breadth. Atlas was planned and built over a period of almost 15 years and has currently been in operation for seven years. Data concerning billions of collisions of particles have been under absolutely incredibly thorough investigation by physicists for years. The numbers of scientists collaborating on Atlas have not exactly been small. The Atlas collaboration has over 3,000 members. Nobody at Atlas has an overview of all the parts and all the functions of the device. For this reason, specialists need to share information constantly. Each member of the Atlas collaboration receives several dozen emails every day and takes part in several meetings with colleagues every week. Within the Atlas collaboration, there are about 400 registered meetings per week and many more informal meetings of two or three scientists. For these reasons, the coffee bars are some of the busiest places at CERN. From morning till evening, every coffee bar buzzes like a beehive and scientists go from table to table and hold discussions over litres and litres of coffee. This helps them to keep going all day and to carry on far into the night. If you've not experienced it for yourself, you will not be able to imagine the tension among 3,000 scientists over a detailed investigation of every sensor, every part and every byte of valuable data. Any meeting could turn out to be the key meeting. Any email might lead to a major step forwards and at any hour a decisive idea might occur to you. You are investigating data that has reached the Earth for the first time in history, and any graph you prepare could contain some shocking information. The results of complicated measurements are carefully compared with theoretical predictions. On the day when there was no longer any doubt that measurements confirmed the theory about the existence of the Higgs boson, there was massive excitement at CERN. If you aren't based at CERN, meetings with your colleagues are held via a video conferencing application. Good morning everybody and welcome to our weekly analysis group meeting. We don't have any general announcement today, but we have a very full agenda. So I would suggest we directly go ahead with the first presentation, which is an update on the BDT-based tagger of the H events. Wojtek, if you're ready, please go ahead. Good morning. As you all know, we are aiming at measuring a new process, which is the production of the Higgs boson in association with the hadronically decaying vector boson. We are trying to separate these events from background with the use of a multivariate technique, the boosted decision tree. Boosted decision tree, likelihood ratio, neural networks, Fisher, discriminant. These are all names of various methods that are referred to together as artificial intelligence. In simple terms, it can be said that artificial intelligence is any kind of computer algorithm that appears from the outside to make decisions about something or to recognize something. But we should not be deceived. It is always an algorithm that is just a calculation or formula. It has nothing at all to do with intelligence. Unless, of course, we have in mind the intelligence of the creator of the algorithm, which may be considerable. Artificial intelligence is always pleasing when it recognizes a pet dog in a photo or the face of our best friend. It helps us to translate into a foreign language, it can talk with us as a virtual assistant, and it can even drive a car. It helps us to make an online search. It plays the role of the bad guy against us in computer games, it deals on the stock exchange, and it protects us against cyber attacks. Particle physicists love it. They use it mainly for something similar to recognizing pet dogs in photos. Experiments in particle physics are rather like big cameras that capture the worst moments in the lives of elementary particles, the moment when they smash together and disintegrate. For each photo, we need to ascertain what particles are in the image, what energy they have, and where they're flying to. And artificial intelligence is happy to provide assistance. 
In the distant past, particle physicists with standard cameras used to photograph a certain substance in which elementary particles leave a visible trace. Large quantities of these photos were acquired, and universities employed whole teams of assistants whose job was to inspect each photo and assess the evidence in it about all the paths of the particles. These assistants were not skilled physicists. They had only been trained to recognize a line of a certain thickness and bent in a certain way, and to identify it, for example, as a proton with energy of 2.54 mega electron volts. They did not need to have any idea of what a proton or a mega electron volt actually is. Today, the principle is basically the same. However, digital images emerge from the experiments and they're examined by artificial intelligence. And, just like the assistants in the early history of particle physics, artificial intelligence is trained to recognize types of particles and their energy. Each artificial intelligence algorithm has undergone a training phase in which it was shown digital records from simulations of experiments and was informed what was in them. A well-trained algorithm recognizes that such and such a combination of data from a digital image was a proton with energy of 2.54 mega electron volts. Besides being a student of physics, Hedvika is also an excellent dancer. She always comes to meetings on her thesis like this. Tak jak si vodně ale pokročila. No, snažila jsem se spočítat ten fake factor jako funkci PT a ETA, ale jsem nějak zasekla na gridu. Spoustu jobů jsou broken, některé ještě ani nezačaly. No, s gridem teď asi budou problémy trochu, protože minulý pátek začala velká produkce Monte Carlo simulace a grid je hrozně přetížený, tak musíme být trpěliví. It's a long time since people use their eyes to scan the data from experiments in particle physics. In those days, the data consisted of ordinary photographs. Now a physicist sits at a computer and writes a long program that scans the data. The data consists of digital images in incredible amounts. The experiments on the LHC accelerator at CERN spat out as many as 88,000 terabytes of data in 2018 alone. Stored on CDs, the data would form a 150 kilometer high column. And if you decided to scan the data using your desktop computer, you would have to wait at least 100 years for your results. Fortunately, the physicists at CERN have a lot more than their desktop computers available for storing and processing the data from the experiments on the LHC accelerator. A vast network of around 170 computing centers in more than 40 countries has been created to meet their needs. It is called the LHC computing grid. The grid as a whole acts like a single massive computer that has a million terabytes of storage space and a million computer cores. Every day, about two million computer tasks are processed. The data flowing from the LHC experiments are stored in the main computing center, which is located directly at CERN. Since they're in a very raw state, the data first need to be pre-processed. The results proceed to further tiers of the grid, where they're processed and filtered again. Imagine that you're a physicist, and you have just for the tenth time tuned your image filtering program to a few collisions that interest you from among all the billions. You press enter to send your program to the grid to go through maybe 500 terabytes of data. The calculation is automatically divided into several tens of thousands of smaller calculations, which are referred to as jobs. These are distributed to computing centers all over the world. There they join the queues of jobs submitted by your colleagues and wait until their turn comes around. After a week, most of your jobs will have gone through, but many are still waiting to be released. However, it is worth the wait. You never know whether you may be rewarded with something beautiful, like this graph, with which CERN won a Nobel Prize for Higgs and Englert. Finally, it's lunchtime. Today's conversation is led by Daniel, who has a passion for free diving. Jsem nedávno byl na Filipínách, hmm. speciálně po tápice. A teda tam byly úžasné zážitky, viděli jsme velrybí žraloky a potápili se s nimi a tak. A to jo, to bylo úžasné. 
A jedno z takových fakt zajímavých míst tam byl malý ostrůvek, že jo, Filipíny jsou spousta ostrovů. Malý ostrůvek a uprostřed něj sladkovodní jezero. A v tom jezeru, jezeru má voda asi nějakých 28 stupňů, ale když se potopíš níž, tak najednou je tam termoklina, rozhraní mezi dvěma různýma typama vody. A pod tím ta voda má 38 stupňů. To je, když do toho vplaveš, to je, jak kdybys najednou vplaval prostě do koupelny, jak bych A že to nepříjemný. A zajímavé ještě je, že ta voda dole, ta teplá voda, je slaná voda. Proto je konec konců ta teplá voda dole. Jako ta, ta slanost bojuje s tou teplotou. A vyhrála teda slanost, takže ta slaná voda je dole. A normálně, když se tam potápíš, tak se na to můžeš podívat a vidíš tam rozhraní těch dvou typů vod. A to je teda docela fascinující zážitek. Daniel does free diving. His record is 50 meters underwater on one breath. Pánové, já měl být před pěti minutama v praktiku. In the labs, students learn how to operate simple experiments, how to detect radiation and how to evaluate and present results in a scientific manner. On the way, they find out some pretty amazing facts. That they would have to eat 10 million bananas for an immediate fatal dose of radiation from potassium-40. That almost every household used to own a small particle accelerator, a cathode ray tube TV. Or that the Earth is constantly being bombarded by particles coming from our galaxy and beyond, with much higher energy than the most powerful accelerators ever built can achieve. Students are often surprised to find out that there is a huge and kind of scary labyrinth of corridors underneath the building where the labs are when they try to activate samples as part of their experiment using the neutron source hidden in the basement. Education is one of the key responsibilities of every physicist. The future of the whole field of study and investigation depends on passing knowledge and experience down to younger generations. Every great discovery in particle physics has its roots firmly in studies carried out by past generations of physicists. Even the greatest discoverer adds only a small part to the whole of human knowledge. Another pillar of particle physics is the exchange of information and the building of personal links among scientists. Countless meetings, consultations, congresses and conferences are organised for this very purpose. The participants present their results to their colleagues and in the breaks they can meet each other, start a longer conversation, or just agree to collaborate straight away. Particle physics faces the opposite problem to the one faced in many engineering and military applications. In particle physics, it is necessary to disseminate the progress and the results of all research to as many people as possible. It is therefore natural that the most important instrument of all for transferring information from person to person was born at CERN, the World Wide Web. Time passes quickly. It's four o'clock already. After lab time, you answer emails, edit a piece of code of your computer program, and perhaps attend one more meeting. is waiting for me. I'm heading home, walking over our favourite bridge, joined by my colleague Daniel. Wojtěch, people often ask me, what are the benefits of particle physics for society? What would be your answer? 
When Anderson discovered antimatter in 1932, he surely never thought that within a hundred years his discovery would form the basis for ordinary equipment that can be found in any major hospital. However, this is what has happened. Positron emission tomography is an expensive but widely used method in medicine for displaying the organs in the human body. An accelerator produces a radioactive element that is introduced into the patient's body. There it breaks down into antiparticles to the electron and each of them immediately annihilates with an electron. From each annihilation, two particles of light emerge that pass through the body and are detected by a device that is similar to the Atlas experiment. All the components of experimental particle physics at the disposal of medicine. The most widely used invention to have emerged from CERN is without doubt the World Wide Web. Everybody knows the initials WWW, but just for the sake of completeness, it is the way to share documents or web pages on the internet and to link text elegantly with references to other pages. This excellent idea, which rapidly changed the lives of people across the planet, was dreamed up and created by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN in 1989. He is the author of HTTP, short for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, the means by which computers on the internet transfer web pages, of Hypertext Markup Language, or HTML, in which the pages are programmed, and the World Wide Web, the first web browser or program which displays text in unreadable HTML language as a beautiful web page. A small plaque in honour of Berners-Lee's world-changing invention hangs in a permanent display dedicated to him near his former office at CERN. There is exceptional competition amongst inventors at CERN. If each of them were to have been awarded a statue, there would no longer be any space left for anything else. Wow, that's a good answer. And what fascinates you about the particle physics itself? Particle physics takes years of hard work before anyone can achieve any results. However, the feeling of working at the cutting edge of human knowledge and understanding, of studying data that no one else on Earth has ever seen, and that I could at any moment find in them something revolutionary, that is what drives me. Not only me, but you and thousands of our colleagues. Most of them keep working long into the night because they have this passion deep inside themselves, and there's nothing that can stop them. We carry our work around with us constantly, and we think about it all the time. To be a part of the experiment that discovered the Higgs boson, and to investigate the data within which it was discovered, that is just fantastic. <laughs>